All right. So the big thing, guys, that we were looking at yesterday in terms of vertical circular motion is that first off, it's not uniform. And the reason it's not uniform is because the forces contributing to the movement change as we go around the circle. All right, so we had talked about three different places on the circle that we would encounter problems. Okay, the first point was on the inside at the bottom of the circle. All right, on the inside at the bottom of the circle, gravity is trying to pull us out of the circle. Our inertia wants us to go this way, so the track has to push hardest here. Or if it's something on a string, the string has to pull hardest at that position, right? So if we're talking about something on a string, this is the point where the string is most likely to break. Okay? It is there where the string will be under the most force. So if a question ever says you have this thing on a string being whirled in a vertical circle, okay, calculate how fast it can go before it'll break. It'll break at the bottom. Okay, so you have to set it up as though you're solving for the speed at the bottom of the circle. It's little things like that that we have to be able to recognize when we read a question. All right, the other place we talked about was if we were on the inside of the circle at the top. Inside of the circle at the top, there are no outside forces. Okay? There are no forces, sorry, acting out of the circle. If we go just fast enough to stay in the circle, Gravity acts as a centripetal force because we're essentially a projectile. We're not pushing on the track, the track's not pushing back. If we go faster than the minimum speed, then there is a normal force pushing us back in. Okay, both of those things would be our forces in. If we were going over the top of the vertical circle on the outside, we could produce a feeling of apparent weightlessness because if we go fast enough, we'll lose contact with the track and we won't have any normal force and thus with no apparent weight. Okay, uh, so at the top, okay, we would have uh, normal force acting out as long as we're not going too fast and gravity acting in. All right, those are the things we have to remember okay, when we're encountering problems to do with vertical circular motion. Okay, so I was telling you, you had that Hot Wheels track when you were a kid. They built that thing for real, for real cars to drive through. There's a picture of it. And it's crazy because there's actually cars going through it. It is pretty epic. Yeah. So you can live out a childhood dream as long as you go fast enough. If you don't go fast enough, you won't be living any dreams anymore because you'll fall flat on your head and that won't be good. Okay. Uh, so that's kind of what we're looking at there. The big thing we need to remember here, guys, about vertical circular motion is that no matter where we are in the circle, centripetal force is the net force. Okay, that's why we can calculate it using forces in minus forces out. All right, and we have to be ready to do that. Okay, questions on that? All right, so if we're going to perform this looping trick, okay, we obviously have to have that minimum speed that occurs at the top of the track. There isn't a minimum speed anywhere else in a vertical circle. There's no minimum speed for the bottom. There's no minimum speed to go over the top. There's just a minimum speed to go on the inside through the top. So if I'm doing that, okay, what are the forces acting on this roller coaster right now? Gravity. Okay, if I'm going just fast enough, is there any normal force? Okay, that's what we have to identify, right? Okay, so we got FC then equals forces in, gravity, minus forces out. There aren't any, okay? There are no forces out in this situation. So I can now calculate what the minimum speed for this loop would be, okay? Um, if I knew, if as long as I knew the radius, I'd be able to calculate that, okay? In this case, I don't know the radius, okay? But if I did, I'd be able to calculate it just by going mv squared over r, equals m times g, okay? Because the m's would cancel, and all I would need to know was r. All right. Everyone kind of follow me on that? That'll be our first example here in a minute. All right, um, now I don't know if these ones still work. They probably don't. Um, I'll show you the Griffin one, because I know it still works. Okay, so let's say we've got this situation here. I have this roller coaster loop, and this is more like what you'll see on the mind bender on Thursday. Okay, it is a perfect vertical circle. It's not an Immelman with a twist. Okay, so uh, we know that the radius of this track is nine meters. 
we want to calculate what the minimum speed would be. Obviously, a roller coaster is going to go way faster than that, but we want to calculate what that minimum speed will be. So we know the radius is 9.0 meters, and that's it. Well, we know gravity is 9.81, right? If we're going just fast enough to stay in the circle, we said just a minute ago that Fg will equal Fc. There are no other forces acting because it, we're, we're going just fast enough. We're not going to push on the track at all, all right? So we'll have m times g equals mv squared over r, and we're looking for v, the minimum speed here. So we're going to multiply both sides by r, okay? m is going to cancel, and we'll be left with v equals the square root of g times r. So 9 meters times 9.81. Whoop. All right, so we're looking at 9.4 meters per second to be the minimum speed, which is still pretty fast. I mean, you could run that fast if you were really going all out, okay? But you couldn't run up the track that fast, okay? You wouldn't be able to, to do that, okay? Everybody kind of follow me on how that one works. That's about as simple as they get. Okay? When we start dealing with there's a force in, there's a force out, okay, stuff like that, then they become a little bit more complex. All right, so that's what we just did there, okay, and we got 9.4 um, meters per second. Now, if I'm going just fast enough to stay in the loop, then I am going to experience a feeling of apparent weightlessness because I'm not pushing on the track, so the track has no reactive force on me that I would feel, so I would not feel my weight at all. All right. Of course, it would go by so quickly that you'd hardly notice it, okay? but it would be true. All right, so we're going to do a couple of examples here, just to make sure we know what we're doing, and then uh, we'll kind of move on a little bit here. Okay, so we just really just did that one, so we're going to skip that one. Okay, um, let's have you do those two. Okay, so they both deal with minimum speed situations. Okay, give those two a try. Minimum speed situations. All right, so this is a demo I used to use, used to do until I nearly killed a student and wrecked the projector all in one swoop. Um, so I don't do it anymore. <laughs> but um, the main reason that I nearly hurt a student and broke the projector was because they don't make pails the way they used to. Okay, ice cream pails used to come with metal handles, and they didn't break. Okay. Now they come with these crummy plastic handles that break under the slightest provocation. So I had this bucket full of water, and I just was whirling it around and around like this right here. And, uh, of course, it where does the handle give out? Right at the bottom. So I'm just at the bottom and starting to come up. Okay, And so it came the handle broke right there, came up, and just went right here and caught the top of this desk. Okay. And then it spilled and the splash went up and nearly got on the projector. Okay. And then got that person wet. Luckily, it wasn't like full on. It hit the desk first. Otherwise, they would have had one gallon of water coming flying right at their head. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, we don't do that anymore for safety purposes. Okay. But you can whirl a bucket around, around and around like this and not get wet. Provided what? Why did you do it fast enough? Okay. The real trick is stopping it and not getting wet. Getting it going is easy. Then you just have to keep it moving. It's when you have to stop it. Okay. Newton's first law still applies. The water wants to keep going. Okay. So you have to kind of catch the water and then kind of do this pendulum thing until you get to the bottom where the water doesn't get, well, you let it go and somebody gets hurt. That's why we don't do it anymore. Okay. So we're whirling this bucket of water around, not on a rope, because that's really crazy. That's how they're doing it. But hey, I didn't do it that way. Um, so we know the radius of the circle in this question is 0.75 meters. The speed of the bucket is three meters per second. What is the tension in the rope at position C, where of course the handle or rope is most likely to break, okay? So we're looking for the tension force, which would be the same as the normal force if this was a track, okay? It's the force that's pulling it back, excuse me, into the middle. All right, so we're dealing with this point where gravity is pulling down, which is out of the circle, and tension is pulling up, which is towards the center, all right? So for all vertical circular motion, 
FC equals the forces in minus the forces out. Okay, so that's going to mean that FC equals the tension in the rope, which is what we're looking for, minus the force of gravity. All right, everyone with me so far? Okay, so if I want to solve for the tension in the rope, I have to add gravity over to this side. So the tension in the rope will be the centripetal force plus the force of gravity, which makes sense. This force needs to be really big. Okay, it's got to offset the force of gravity here. All right. Okay, so now I need to plug in my, my formulas in order to calculate this. So T will equal mv squared over r, that's our formula for fc, plus m times g, force of gravity. All right. Now I just plug in my numbers. Okay, so this was a uh, 1.5 kilogram bucket okay, times uh, 3 squared. They told us that we were th moving at 3 meters per second. They told us the radius of the circle was 0.75. Right? And then we're going to add that to 1.5 times 9.81. So we have 1.5 times 9 divided by 0.75 okay, plus 1.5 times 9.81. All right, so there's going to be 32.7 newtons of force okay, of tension in that rope in order to pull this off. Well, no, because tension goes both ways. I mean, you could say into the circle if you wanted to, but it's tension, right? It pulls equally. All right, everyone kind of follow me there? All right, so that's kind of the, the next level of question. The next level after that would be a similar question, except they would maybe give you the tension and ask you to solve for how fast it was spinning. All right, so you would have to first off do a you know calculation like this where you isolate the formulas and then start moving pieces of the formulas around to isolate individual variables. It's just algebra, okay, but it just becomes a bit more involved as we progress along the way here. All right, any more questions on that one? All right, um, so I put the information up here for that example again because you need it. Okay. Um, but it's the same as it was before. I want you guys to try those three questions there and see how we do on those, and we'll go over them here in a minute. Situation where we're at the top of the circle. Okay, so we're trying to calculate the tension in the rope at the top of the circle. Here at the top of the circle, we have gravity acting in, and we have normal force, or in this case, tension, also acting into the circle. There are no forces out on the inside at the top. Okay, now on the inside at the top. So FC is going to equal the forces in, that'll be tension plus the force of gravity, and no forces out. So in order to calculate tension, we're going to have FC minus FG, because tension would be a lot smaller at the top of the circle than it would be at the bottom where we added those two. Okay, so um, all we have to do is kind of the same calculation we did before. We'll have mv squared over r, okay, this time minus m times g, so it'll be um, our 1.5 times 3 squared divided by um, 0.75, and this time minus 1.5 times 9.81. Okay, and when we do that, we should get 3.3 newtons down. I wouldn't say I would say you wouldn't need to include that direction because again, it's a tensional force, and tension works both ways. All right, for question number two, the thing with number with question number two is this. There's only one force acting back towards the circle or towards the center of the circle on the sides. Because what way does gravity act on the sides? Straight down. That's neither into nor out of the circle. It's perpendicular to the circle. Thus, it has no effect on any of the circular forces at either position 90 degrees to top or bottom. Okay. So that's why this one works out, and because I think a few people realized this, okay, they started kind of, how do I do this? So they just went, all right, FC equals MV squared over R. I have all of that, so I'm just going to do that. And they realized that comes out to 18 newtons. Right? And the reason it comes out to 18 newtons is because there's only one force acting back towards the center on the side, and that's the force in the rope. Okay. So it's still a forces in minus forces out question. There's just no forces out. So it's just equal to the tension there. 
All right. Um, try number three. This is one of the ones next level ones I was talking about. They're giving you the information and asking you to calculate the speed of the rock at one of the positions. Okay, so I'll give you a couple minutes on that one. All right. So question number three is dealing with the top on the inside of the vertical circle. So we've got the rock okay, attached by a, a string or a rope or whatever it is here and being spun in a vertical circle. Right? At the top then, we know we have tension in the rope as well as the force of gravity pulling the rock down towards the center of the circle. There are no forces out at this position. So we're going to have Fc equals forces in, that'll be tension plus the force of gravity, minus forces out. There aren't any. All right, so now, okay, we can calculate the speed of the rock. We know what the tension is. We know it's 79, okay, and we can calculate the force of gravity because we know the mass of the rock. We have the radius, so what we need to do next is put the formulas in here. So I have mv squared over r equals t plus, what's going on here? Okay, m times g, it's disconcerting. All right, um, so we've got that set up now. Okay, now we're going to look at how do I isolate the speed of the rock, All right? So I've got to bring r over to the other side, so I'll multiply both sides by r. So essentially then I'm kind of bracketing this and going r, and then dividing both sides by m. m doesn't cancel in this situation, so make sure you don't do that, it's not in every term. And then I'm gonna square root that to get my, my V, all right? So V will equal the square root of 79 Newtons, that's the tension, plus 0.98 times 9.81 times the radius, which was uh, 0.4 meters, divided by 0.98. All right, so if I plug all that into my calculator, okay, then I should get six meters per second as my answer. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, possibly. Yeah. Well, yeah, when you have an addition operation, it's not always wise to do that, but and, because it's not in this term. Okay. Um, questions on how that one worked? So, I mean, really not a whole lot more intuitive than the other ones we've done. It's just this one has more algebra because I have to isolate an individual variable rather than a force. Okay, so just a little bit more algebra work to do on that one. All right, so uh, we don't need to do that one. Okay, I want you guys to try um, question number one there. Don't worry about question number two. Just try question number one. All right. So the trick with number one is it's not a vertical circular motion question. It's an artificial gravity question like we talked about yesterday and the day before that. Okay, So if I'm going to generate artificial gravity, I want the centripetal force that's provided by the inside of the spinning drum to equal what force? Force of gravity. Right. Right. So that means I can essentially eliminate this middle part and just say that mv squared over r equals m times g. Now, they want to know what the frequency would be. That's fine. I can do this in two steps, solve for V and then find frequency, or I can do this and say that V equals two times pi times R times F and substitute that in for V, which is what I'm going to do because it takes less time. All right, so I'm going to have M times, uh, whoop, squared, M four pi squared R squared times F squared divided by R. Okay, um, so what's going to happen then okay, is that my R on the bottom is going to go away completely and this squared is going to go away here and that's going to equal M times G. Then I'm just going to isolate F. So I'm going to bring everything else over. M's going to cancel. Okay, and I'm going to have G divided by 4 pi squared times R. Okay, square rooted. Okay, that'll give me F. So F will be, in this case, the square root of 9.81 divided by 4 pi squared times uh, 30 meters, right? Yeah, 30 meters.
Okay, so I'm getting a very small frequency there, okay, um, 0.91, right, which is what they've got as well. Right, everybody okay with that? You could have done it in two steps too, that's fine. Okay, I just wanted to keep showing you this substitution thing because, like I say, it's going to become important later. All right, you know, right, what usually gives people trouble with this question is the two times heavier than normal. All right, so um, we're traveling through this 35 meter loop. Okay, we're at the bottom of it. So we're in this situation here where we feel heaviest. We have a normal force acting in. That's our force that we feel. We have the force of gravity acting out. All right, we're told they feel two times heavier than normal. This is the force you feel. It's your apparent weight. Okay, so at the bottom of a loop, okay, they're telling me that FC equals forces in minus forces out. I feel two times heavier than normal. Well, that would mean, like, how do I calculate how heavy I am normally? Mass times acceleration due to gravity. But I feel two times heavier than that. So that would be 2mg minus mg. So I've got mv squared over r equals I feel two times heavier than normal, but I'm actually just normal, okay? So I subtract them, and then I'm solving for v, all right? But a lot of people just misinterpret that. Hey, if I'm two times heavier than normal, I'm 2mg. That's two times my weight, okay? If I'm four times heavier than normal, it's 4mg, all right? That's all there is to it. Okay, so when we manipulate that out, Okay, what we'll have here is we're going to multiply both, well, actually, first we'll simplify this. 2mg minus mg is just mg. All right, so I've got mv squared over r equals mg. The m's are going to cancel. I'm going to bring r over here, okay, and square root. How many times has it been the square root of ger for us? Like lots, right? Okay, so um, this is what we'll have, okay, 9.81 times 35. Okay, square rooted. All right, we got 18 and a half meters per second in order to make people feel that way. All right. Questions on that one? Okay, try that one. Okay, just to get you started on this one, we're going over the top of a vertical circle. That means we're on the outside, okay, going over the top. So forces involved, gravity is pulling down and towards the center, where is normal force? Out, okay? And remember, another way to, uh, another name for normal force is apparent weight. They want you to find the apparent weight in this question. All right. 